Michelle Marie McGrath. Today I have the lovely Nicola Newman with me and we're going to you know hear all about Nicola and what she's up to and how she came to be child free and sort of yeah a bit about her background so Nicola is an award-winning artist she's an organic gardening teacher an author and entrepreneur and her mission is to help women explore their creativity and inspire them to live an authentic life that supports their heart's deepest desires to be self-expressive and enjoy even greater well-being. She has a Bachelor of Fine Art and she's produced and directed three documentaries on contemporary Australian artists and has her paintings featured in a multitude of public and private collections all around the world. She is an, the author of Grow Abundant Herbs and Greens in Pots and creator of two acclaimed online training courses, The Abundant Veggie Patch System and Grow Organic Food in Pots. Nicola's taught hundreds of beginner gardeners worldwide to grow in their own organic food and nurture their health and she's currently working on a new project, Flourish with Painting and Creativity, which is an amazing sounding online program and mentorship program dedicated to teaching practical, soulful, nurturing ways to explore painting with acrylic and oil paints and express your innate creativity. So I love the sound of that. And um, yeah, I'm quite keen to maybe enroll in that course myself, I think. So looking forward to hearing more about that. So welcome, Nicola. Thank you very much, Michelle. That was a lovely intro. <laughs> so yeah, lovely to have you. And I'm just, yeah, it just seems that everything you're doing is really reinforcing that sort of creative expression. That's right. I'm really keen to help people break down some of the ideas that they might hold that they uh, are not creative or uh, that they're not an artist and help them get back into touch with that natural knowing that everybody has in being a creative soul. Yeah, and I suppose one of the traditional ways that women would express their creativity is going through the traditional process of you know, giving birth, having a baby in that sense. But for people who have chosen not to do that and go down that traditional route, or maybe they can't, you know, for whatever reason, and everybody's in a different situation and, you know, number of various circumstances. So would you mind sharing a little bit with us about whether or not, you know, that's been as a result of personal choice or through different circumstances? Sure thing. So I suppose it's been a gradual process. When I was younger, I always imagined myself having children, but mm. mostly because I thought that uh, it would kick in at some age where I would just desperately, desperately want one. That's the way that my yeah. mum had experienced having me. She got to about 30 years old and she said the hormones just kicked in and she was um, so upset at the thought of not having a child. And so I thought, oh, I'll just rely on that <laughs> natural process to take place and I'll know when it's time. But at the same point, um, I didn't actually want children. So mm. when those hormones never kicked in, it was actually a freeing experience and, a, and when I came back to my uh, well my, my centre I suppose and and talking with my mum one day she said you know sweetheart I can see that you're creating many other things in your life through your business and in nurturing people in that way you, I, you, probably, you don't have to have children and it was a really liberating feeling I actually yeah felt freer at the idea of not having them so it was a, a gradual shift yeah I mean it's interesting that isn't it and great that your mum was able to kind of be that open with you because often people really feel that pressure mm -hmm. to have a child even if they're not completely sure that's what they want but they feel the pressure often from their family who are you know waiting for grandchildren or their friends are all having babies and you know sometimes like you're saying, people are thinking, oh, well, you know, surely that need or desire or urge will kick in at some stage, but it doesn't for everybody. 
That's right. Yeah, I, I felt really lucky that it did come from my mum, I think, because she obviously knows me very well. And as you say, you, you do expect to have some pressure from your <laughs> from your mum wanting grandkids. And to hear her kind of lightness about the situation changed my perspective. Yeah, I was lucky. Yeah, and so I guess, well, you are expressing that energy through the work that you're doing. You are expressing that sort of creative essence and force. And there can be like a lot of stereotypes around even the word creativity and that whole theme, can't there? Like often people will think, well, you know, I can't draw. I'm not mm-hmm. creative. And they can have quite a narrow um, perception of what to be creative means when, you know, it could, you know, that could sort of manifest in any any number of ways. Definitely. I think, um, you know, the way that we arrange the furniture in our home is mm. a, as a form of creativity and the way that we put together a meal is another um, expression of, be, of creating something. All that creativity is is creating something. So whether you're creating a mood or an environment or an experience, it's all still creating, isn't it? Yeah. And I mean, we're just kind of innately creative beings, aren't they? By the nature of our existence, you know, it's really sort of that giving ourselves permission to express ourselves in a way that's true for us um however you know that may sort of however that may unfold that's something that feels authentic for us definitely that's exactly right and I I think that's where it's so easy to get swayed off track if you're not giving yourself some time to tune in to listen to yourself and for me I've found do it using a process called morning pages very helpful for that so I'll sit down and write have you heard of morning pages yeah that's, so that's yeah. from Julia Cameron isn't it the artist's that, way that's a great book that's right that's right um and so do you want to yeah maybe share a little about the process of that for people that are not familiar with it sure so it's um ideally done in the morning um and you just sit down and write it in longhand approximately three pages and it's a stream of consciousness form of writing so you don't have to edit yourself you don't have to use proper grammar and spelling thankfully because I'm not a great speller and um, (laughs) and it's really about just allowing yourself to have this outpouring and see what comes up on the page from all these little thoughts that niggle around in your head sometimes they can just be very Uh, trivial kind of things you know I have to go to the shops today and I need to buy some more groceries we're running out of food and um, or it could be you know what I'm just so agitated in my relationship I can't believe he's doing this or doing that or um, and then you you see this information reflected back to you and it can give you a tool to start to make adjustments because I think it's so easy to be in denial and always looking outside of yourself to find what you need to be doing in your life and what I love about the uh, morning pages is it's just a tool for listening to your heart really yeah yeah and and often bringing a lot of clarity isn't it when you see it on paper in black and white something that you might not have even been you know fully aware of that was bothering you definitely definitely yeah so it's interesting and so how did you get into your creative work like how has that been something that you'd always been interested in It certainly has been. I was always making things when I was a young girl. Um, My parents were away a lot and I had a nanny who loved to play what I would just call making things. (laughs) So we we would make puppets or we'd be making coloured sand bottles or tie-dyeing things. And uh, being creative was a huge part of my identity and my way of um, being in the world. But I didn't know that you could be an artist. I didn't associate with artists when I was growing up it was my parents had been veterinarians and then they were um had their own business and I associated a lot with people from a science background and from well the business world I suppose and the idea of being an artist in today's day and age was completely foreign to me I thought that all died out with Picasso (laughs) (laughs) um and it wasn't until I was in my late teens that I discovered a a tutor in Brisbane who helped me put together a portfolio to go to TAFE and I studied art at TAFE and then I went on to uni and did my bachelor there and it was really through that process I didn't ever expect to make money out of it or support myself through being creative but 
one thing led to another and I ended up having exhibitions and they sold out and I thought, well, this is better than <laughs> working in a cake shop, which is what I was doing at the time. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's interesting, isn't it, that you say that because, again, that's another sort of example of, you know, often fe- people feel that the creative life, you know, um, in inverted commas, is not something they're going to necessarily be able to make money through. And so often they don't listen or take seriously those sort of urges that they've got to, to make or create something. Definitely, definitely. And again, I think that a lot of those um, ideas can be passed down from our parents, similar yeah. to having children in a way. Yes. You know, make sure you get a stable job and you. Um, it can be laughed off the idea of, making a living as an artist but it is possible and it um is yes definitely possible if you put your heart and soul and mind to it Mm. so you've got I mean a very full sort of life with what you're doing with your teaching and writing and your artwork and all of that and so do you feel that you know say for example you did have young children Mm -hmm. you wouldn't have had the same amount of space to be able to to dedicate your energy and your focus to those endeavors Definitely. I mean, that was a really huge part of this conversation that I had with my mum and um, I said, mum, I just, you know, I at the time I was also um, suffering chronic fatigue, so I didn't have very much energy uh, anyway and I'm, I'm not huge on routine and the idea of having a child that I had to get up for and take care of, I, I physically wouldn't have been able to do it around this time when I was tossing up whether or not I wanted kids. And... And then so the reliability and feeling like I couldn't provide for them what they would need and also the absolute distress that it brought to me on a soul level of um, the idea of getting up and taking them to school every day and having Mm. to wake up early and I just don't function like that. It would really take a big change in my lifestyle to be able to accommodate these other urges that I have, like you say, for painting and writing and creating and running a business. Um, to have accommodated that and I couldn't see how it would fit in and I'm sure if I had a real real pull to want kids then yeah. I would have made it work but I didn't so that's where I'm at at the moment and um, I'm, I'm, I, Andrew and I um, still talk about kids every now and again we'll, we'll just I'll check in and I was holding a baby the other day and I was like, do I want one? (laughs) And I really allow myself to feel it so that I can still change my mind if I choose down the track. But it's not there and that urge is not there. So at least I know in my heart I'm not cutting myself off from making a decision and saying I'm going to be child-free forever. But... um, I possibly will be, but I might not be. Hmm. Yeah, and and that I think that's the key, though, isn't it? You're making sure you are checking in with yourself. You're being really honest with yourself about how you're feeling at that time, and obviously you're having that communication with your husband mm-hmm. to make sure that you're both on the same page about that. And so I think that's often the thing is that, you know, we do really need to listen to ourselves and follow what's right for us and not be too unduly swayed by the opinions of those closest to us or those around us. Mm. You know, um, I know that, you know, people sort of can be very well-meaning, but also it can kind of be, you know, a bit offensive, that whole thing of, well, you know, what if you change your mind or, oh, you'll change your mind when you meet the right person, you know, who's going to look after you when you're old, you know, all of these types of kind of stereotypes really where you think, well, you know, are any of those things really a valid enough reason to go ahead and have this experience if it's really not something that I 100% feel in my heart that I really want to commit myself to this? There's a couple of things I thought of while you're saying those points. I've known friends who were not that sure about having children and, you know, they had a lot of anxiety and doubts and couldn't see how it was going to fit in with their business, but they their husband really wanted them and part of them did. So they went through uh, kinesiology and found ways to support themselves and now they have children and obviously they're thrilled. People don't yes. tend to regret, you know, once you, you've done it. You wouldn't admit it anyway. You yeah, regret but- it. And so everyone, I think, makes the best of what we've got and what we decide. Um, and coming back to also you know, that thing of who's going to look after you when you're old. And I remember talking to my mum and she was saying, well, sweetheart, I think if you have – relationships in your life and if you're actually building solid relationships in your life 
that's where you're going to have people around you when you're old. Just having children is no guarantee that they're going to stick around, you know. That's like, right. Yeah. You mean <laughs> they may not even be in the same country, never mind the same city. And even if you've got a good relationship with them, it doesn't necessarily mean that they've got the ability or the resources to, you know, be there as a carer per se, if that, you know, because obviously that is a situation that can arise sometimes for people. Yeah. So there's no, you know, there's no guarantee of any of that, is there really? And it's not really a reason to make a decision about that. Mm, yeah, definitely. So it's interesting. I mean, I know that you have got um, a stepchild, Nicola, and so obviously these days are, you know, in our society now, like families come in all shapes and sizes, forms, configurations. We're much more sort of, you know, there's so many different things that make up a family you know we're not just in that sort of um heterosexual relationship 2.4 you know kids with a dog and all that I mean we're, we're you know we're just so much more blended and we travel more you know much more sort of multicultural and same-sex marriages and all of this kind of thing so you know it's it's a very different scenario in our world today mm. so what are the, some of the things that you kind of, you know, are faced with in like a step parent relationship? What are some of the sort of gifts and the challenges that you kind of experience with that? It took me totally by surprise that I would end up in this very blessed situation where my husband actually raised his daughter by himself before he and I met. So when Andrew and I met, Sky, our beautiful, beautiful uh, daughter, was already 21. And um, I, he, Andrew had her when he was very young and I was quite nervous actually meeting her and I wasn't sure how this would unfold but I met her very quickly um, at the side of our relationship and she was just gorgeous and she's such a confident girl and so um, funny and so witty and Andrew's done a great job um, instilling lots of uh, ind individuality in her that it made our relationship very easy to come together and she could see how happy her dad was and that I think is all that she really cared about yeah. um, and she we just love each other like I can't believe how much I love my stepdaughter and and she loves me but you know what it wasn't until last month she was staying with us um and she had gone out for a massage and I'd booked her in with this lady who I get a massage with and, and the lady said so are you are you like Nicola's stepdaughter is she your stepmom and and Sky said well yeah um but I don't really like to think of her like that because stepmom you know sounds sort of nasty and evil <laughs> and and Sky and I didn't have a language that was the first time that we'd broached the subject that she's actually my stepdaughter and I'm her stepmom. Like we didn't have a language for it because we're only 11 years apart. Mm. And so it's kind of funny to think of being her stepmom. We're really friends, but I do also feel a sense of um, oh, privilege and honour at being able to nurture her in some ways and give her some tips and guidance in starting her career as a photographer she's really great at photography and so it's it's a real blessing it's just been a blessing I've been very very lucky mm. yeah and so I mean it, it's interesting that isn't it and like you say because you've not got like a gigantic sort of age gap you are probably more like friends really than that mm. you know how we'd sort of envisage that more and often I mean the archetype of stepmother can have quite negative connotations can't it again that's a bit of a you know, a cultural kind of storyline, like things like, you know, Cinderella, Cruella de Vil, all that mm -hmm. kind of thing. It can be a bit of a negative sort of, you know, projection and, and often can be quite a difficult role um, for some women, especially if their partner has gone through an unpleasant sort of breakup in the children. It's a difficult situation that can be quite sensitive um, for a lot of people. Oh, definitely, definitely. It can get quite um, complicated because there's so many different relationships that are going on then within, yeah. A, within yeah, that nucleus. So there's 
relationships with the with their biological mother and then and loyalties uh, towards her and all kinds of yeah I've been there as well I am a step I am a stepdaughter too so I yeah was actually projecting some of my experiences onto Sky and I expected her to feel the way that I had felt when my dad remarried um, or married yeah and she didn't feel those things at all because it was a totally different situation. Um, but I was not, I didn't have a good experience with my stepmom, that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? I'm so, if I'm, you know, part of a step family as well. Like my parents split up when I was three. And um, so again, yeah. So, you know, and then my stepfather came into my life when I was 15. So it's just that thing of it can be kind of quite tricky. Mm. Um but yeah, I mean, I, I don't think it's an, an easy kind of scenario all round, really. So, um, yeah, have you got any advice for somebody who, you know, they might be in a relationship with somebody with children and they're embarking on that? Wow. I think a lot of it comes down to actually a lot of the way that those premises are set up has a lot more to do with the way that their biological parent um, helps the child to feel. So they need to really make sure they keep nurturing their Mm. relationship with the child and it will make it easier, hopefully. So that they feel as secure as possible in that new situation. That's right. And this other new person, I guess we're speaking to women today, so this new woman isn't replacing the child in the man in that dad's life yeah or, I mean it can be it can be it can be very difficult can't it? it can be fraught with a lot of tension depending on like you say how the biological parents are kind of dealing with that situation because often obviously the children can be caught in the middle of that so exactly yeah and try not to keep put the kids in the middle of things that's so important that's so important um not to play them off with with their parents but I guess I, in some ways I can't comment too much because I've been really lucky. Andrew's um, ex or, you know, Sky's mum hasn't been in his life for a very long time, so I don't have to deal with that yeah. um, added complexity. And and Sky is just a really well-rounded girl, so sh- she's easy to get along with. Yeah, fortunately. Yeah. <laughs> mm, yeah. yeah, and so do you sort of feel, Nicola, that, you know, Obviously, there are benefits that you've kind of experiencing through that situation. Um, have there been kind of, you know, sort of unexpected sort of challenges or things that you've learned that, you know, have been kind of sort of brought you sort of more self-awareness in that, in that situation? Like you say, it's not something that you were expecting and it sounds mm. like you're, you know, receiving a lot of blessings through that. Yeah, definitely. I, and I guess the, um, the lesson that I learned was actually like a an, what's the like a positive negative or negative yeah. like and that was that I um when I was first getting to know Sky uh that was the only time I actually suffered an anxiety attack in the courting stage of Andrew's and my relationship and it wasn't anything to do with he and I but it was all my own projections of how I thought this relationship would turn out and the, the impact that I could have on her and I didn't want her to go through what I'd gone through yeah. and so it was really a lesson in staying present and looking at her and realizing that she was so happy for her dad and it wasn't the way that my experience had been so instead coming back to the present and and um, allowing her to have her own experience and allowing our relationship to develop just naturally and doesn't have to be forced um yes. and it's take it's it's been a really lovely journey we, we set up our spare room as uh, sky's room and she she works actually on lady elliot island and works for 10 days and then she comes off for four days and occasionally she'll come and stay with us and i just love it like i i, I thought for you know for a long time i've actually lived alone and the other night she was staying here and I went to sleep and I thought, my whole family is here. I've got a husband and Andrew and I met and got married within three months and then I've got Sky, a ready-grown daughter and a little puppy mm-hmm. who replaced my other dog that I'd had for 15 years and I loved and I had to put down and I had thought at that stage that I was going to be single for a long time and all of a sudden it wasn't that way. So I guess if my mm. my lessons have been don't, believe the stories in your head sometimes yes. of how you well, think the well most of the time yeah. <laughs> yeah well pretty much all the time <laughs> 
exactly. yeah it's so it's so true isn't it I mean mm. you just reminded me then of like you know the work of Byron Katie yes who um you know she's all that thing about don't believe your thoughts and that's the only time that we ever experience misery you know is when we believe our untrue thoughts so yeah I mean I think that's a it's such a good reminder isn't it of like you know imagine if this doesn't turn out well and then it's like well imagine if this turns out brilliantly that's right that's right and keep focusing on what is actually coming up in front of you and listen to the person in front of you and that's the only way to feel peace I think yes (laughs) that's right and and all we ever know is what's happening at this moment anyway that is the only Mm -hmm. guarantee that we have isn't it you know so it's the only guaranteed outcome is what's happening right now that's right yeah that's right and so look I think that's that's so lovely and like you're saying also about I keep sort of really feeling like with that whole thing around being open and that's really about being very open to how the creative energy and life force moves through us isn't it about what our attitude is to life in general and um, being open to all sorts of possibilities like you were saying that you know you didn't anticipate that you were going to sort of meet somebody and be married within a three-month period Mm. and so we just never never know in my wildest dreams thought that would happen (laughs) yeah I mean so we do we just don't know do we you know so it's about that being open so have you got sort of any advice for you know for women that are really say they're coming to terms with the fact that either a that they don't want children or, or that's not going to be their reality but you know they really want to find a way to sort of reignite that creative energy and essence within them and be open to create a new possibility what are some sort of just simple ways that people can start to feel more creative if they're just you know not really feeling that definitely well there was a period um in my mid-teens where that was when I found out my parents were getting divorced and it was a real shock and I basically lost all my creativity um in that time and and it was a terrible feeling I felt um like part of me was missing but the thing that I found helpful to reignite that was taking short courses and I my mum was really good at encouraging me to do like a photography course at the local adult education institute and then I did a picture framing course and I did a silk painting course and just doing little things that I think you can bring into your your schedule and they might not even last for terribly long but give yourself a taste of these these different modalities and then Mm. that can ignite a passion and a real interest and you'll find something that draws you on and that you really want to explore and honestly, at the moment, um, my painting thrills me. I Sometimes I wake up and I just want to go down to the studio and pick up my favourite brush and there's this one kind of orange that I'm in love with at the moment and I want to just brush this orange on canvases and it makes me so happy. Beautiful. Um, so, and so I think it can be a very simple thing but allow yourself to explore different just give you like a smorgasbord of playtime to find something for you for your soul and just Mm. really giving yourself that permission isn't it permission's huge huge definitely it doesn't have to be perfect you don't have to show anyone um and you can make a mess and all those (laughs) things (laughs) the messier the better definitely (laughs) definitely Mm. oh well thank you Nicola that's great and you know just so lovely to hear your positive kind of experience with a stepchild in that way as well well even though she's an adult she's not a child as such now But um, yeah, no, and great to hear your insights about working with creativity. Thank you, Michelle. It's been a real pleasure. I really enjoyed it. Unclassified Woman.